Welcome to this video lecture from JMI, the Jewish Music Institute. My name is Gil Karpus, Events and Marketing Manager for the JMI. In this lecture, you're going to hear from Dr. Ilana Webster-Kogan, the Joe Loss Senior Lecturer in Jewish Music at SOAS, University of London. Dr. Webster-Kogan was the co-convener of JMI's Yalla, Judeo-Arabic Music Conference in February 2020 that happened in London. We will now see and hear Dr. Webster Cogan's lecture entitled The Moroccan Torah, Ritual, Drama, Magic. Hi, I'm Ilana Webster Cogan, the Joe Law Senior Lecturer in Jewish Music at SOAS University of London. Thanks for joining us and for supporting the Jewish Music Institute. I'm thrilled to be able to share my most recent research with you, and I hope you enjoy listening. In December, I attended a Shabbat morning service in the western inner suburbs of Paris. The Torah reading was a complicated one that day, since it was Shabbat and Hanukkah and also Rosh Chodesh, so there were three scrolls, which only happens a few times per year. The first seven aliyot went as normal, and then they switched scroll. They made no announcement to the congregation where they were, but my 25 years of chanting the Torah told me that we were in Numbers 28, Parashat Pinchas. The woman sitting next to me in a Chanel suit started asking around, Usom knew, and when nobody knew, she tried to call down to her husband on the ground floor. I handed her my book and whispered in my best approximation of a French accent in Hebrew, C'est le maftir pour Roche Hodesh, Bamid Bar 28. Amazingly, she understood, and she immediately called out the page to all the women around her, C'est le maftir pour Roche Hodesh, Bamid Bar 28. I felt proud, not necessarily for having the answer to hand, but for nailing the code switching in two languages that weren't my own. Sociolinguists would have plenty to say about this grammatically straightforward sentence, but I mention it because it literally took me 25 years of training to prepare it. I spent my whole adolescence learning to chant Torah in the Eastern Ashkenazi style that predominates in North America and Israel, learning every weekday portion and teaching dozens of Shabbat portions. Eventually, I moved on to special readings and to Amim, like the Five Scrolls, and High Holiday Variances. When I came to the UK, I did the same with Western Ashkenazi Trop, and eventually and more recently with the Moroccan to Amim. That specialist knowledge was required to know, without announcement in the women's gallery, that the first maftir was for Rosh Chodesh, which is to say that the first supplementary Torah reading was the one for the new month, always chanted from Parashat Pinchas, or Numbers chapter 28. Insider knowledge was the prerequisite, but I also had to translate that information to the women around me. This required 11 levels at the Alliance Francaise, learning the French pronunciation of Hebrew words, and making a good faith attempt at the Arabic inflected accent on Hodesh. This required what sociolinguists call code switching, or moving between two languages or dialect, and the matched guise technique, where a speaker takes on the speech characteristics of their conversation partner. In effect, my attempt to render myself an insider was a, a performance. I remained an outsider because nobody in the synagogue knew me, but I presented myself as some variation of an insider by knowing the right place in the Torah and articulating it in properly rendered dialect. And it goes without saying that the text in question is far less known in the women's gallery. When we read from the Torah, it's often impossible to tell from the scroll itself whether it's Sephardi or Ashkenazi, or indeed the era of its writing. That's why I was so excited to be introduced to the Pereira Scroll, as I'm calling it, which was written in 1734 in Morocco and is currently housed in London. I had the opportunity to read from it when a kind soul with some authority allowed me to inspect it not long ago, traversing the strict gatekeeping that usually keeps women away from certain ritual objects. It was no doubt the oldest scroll I've ever handled, and it possessed a few noteworthy characteristics that deserve further examination. For example, its scribe wrote the letter Ayn with a heavy script, making it appear darker and thicker than the other letters, and sloping below the line. Is this a reminder today to British Jews not to forget their Sephardi origins as they become increasingly English? Or is it a signature of a scribe who has been lost to history? Or is it an idiosyncrasy like the columns that contained 46 lines of, instead of the more common 42? The scroll leave me with a lot of questions, and being near it makes me feel a bit emotional. This text holds visceral power over its practitioners as a living document, despite millennia of textual fixity. Mostly, though, I want to know, what's it doing in London? 
Joshua Schreier's wonderful book, The Merchants of Oran, brings some light to the extraordinary story of the Pereira Scroll through analysis of super merchant Jacob Lassery's trade relations with England in the early 19th century. The city of Tetuan in northern Morocco was a major center for Megorashim, the Jews of Spain who settled in Morocco after the expulsion, speaking the Ladino dialect called Hakitia, and eventually coming to form the majority of the merchant class in Gibraltar, less than 100 kilometers away. Eventually, Rabbi Isaac Neto moved from Gibraltar to London in 1728 to become the rabbi at Bevis Mark Synagogue, and this administrative spiritual channel remained open for centuries. Indeed, the Pereira Scroll perhaps even made its way to London during Neto's tenure. When the scroll came to London, it brought with it a story of circulation and empire, and of the abiding centrality of the Torah in the dramatic and mobile lives of the Jewish people. When I found the Pereira Scroll, I had been working for some months on a project tracing historic North African Torah scrolls across triangular paths of migration. Some Torah scrolls are written in Israel and sent to congregations in France, who trace their lineage to Algeria, and some scrolls are written in Morocco and follow their community to France, even if many members of the community eventually wind up in Israel. Unlike other forms of triangular migration, such as the transatlantic one, this triangle moves in every direction, with Moroccan Israelis traveling to Morocco as tourists, and the occasional French Jew even moving back to Morocco. Finding the Pereira Scroll here in London turns my triangle into a sort of trapezoid, which in turn becomes a web quickly when we consider Montreal and all the other unexpected places that the Jews of Morocco continue to end up. My journey has not been obstacle-free, as working on this project would no doubt be much easier to manage if I were a man. But I have been introduced to some extraordinary Torah scrolls, including several from Baghdad that are inscribed on leather. Apparently there are 50 in the UK alone. A circuit through the Sephardi synagogues in London would yield scrolls that have made the journey from Israel, North Africa, Baghdad, the Netherlands, the Ottoman Empire, the USA, and beyond. We can find Torah scrolls from places where there is no longer a community. We can find Torah scrolls from places where the governing political entity folded a century ago, such is the resilience of this text. And I certainly wasn't expecting to encounter so early in my fieldwork, and in London of all places, so poignant an example of the complicated global trade in Sifre Torah. If we may be permitted to extrapolate from objects to people, then here was the stark evidence of the messiness of Ida, the intermingling of Jews, and Nusachim, liturgical practices from across the globe. On my first research trip for a new project, I seek out French-speaking synagogues in Tel Aviv. There are a lot of them. Not Moroccan synagogues, strictly speaking, because those could equally be for the Moroccans who immigrated in the 1960s. No, these synagogues are populated with the new French population of Tel Aviv, thousands of them, either Olim Chadashim, or members of what's called the Boeing Aliyah, who commute to and from France, or an even larger demographic of French Jews who rent an apartment in Israel for the summer, or keep one there, as they say, just in case. At that point in my research, I was kind of in the dark. I didn't know much Moroccan liturgy, and I attended a Friday night service so there was no Torah reading. I followed along and eventually got the hang of the Kabbalat Shabbat liturgy, sung together, one main tune, lots of participation from children. There were only a handful of women there, and as usual, I couldn't see the teva, the elevated table for recitation, because of an imposing latticework mechitza. After the service, it felt awkward to linger. I didn't know anyone, and my French wasn't quite good enough for casual chit-chat with strangers. But as I reached the front door, I had a clear view of the Ark. I saw all of the men in the congregation huddled around it, waiting for a turn to kiss the Ark or the Torah. I have since learned that this is standard practice in many Sephardi rites, but at the time, I thought it seemed a bit... Well, sometimes Ashkenazi Jews would say pagan, a term that I now realize isn't quite appropriate, but that sprang to mind then. Kissing the Torah is nothing new. The processional is part of every Torah service. But watching the long line of men waiting to kiss the Ark as the culmination of the service seemed like a new thing to me. Looking into the origins of the custom led me to the remarkable work of Israeli anthropologist Yoram Bilu, especially his work on what he calls Saint Impresarios, or people in Israel who host Saint Veneration. Moroccan Judaism, in its most folk religion form, has 656 named saints, 20% of them women, and many of their shrines still standing in Morocco. Many shrines continue to attract tourism in Tunisia. I learned that in the Atlas Mountains, Muslim women would stand in synagogue doorways and listen to the Torah reading in the belief that hearing or touching the Torah brought good luck and fertility. 
My experience listening to the chanting of the Torah in the Moroccan style has felt distinct to me from any other experience of the Torah, be it Ashkenazi, Sephardi, or Yemenite. The ritual is the same in many ways, identical texts and identical order of service, but with the active participation of women in the gallery, which I find highly unusual by Orthodox standards, the manifestly personal relationship with the Torah, and the long history of scrolls that often span centuries and continents, the Moroccan Torah service is rendered in such a way as to convey drama. The service is not abided passively as it is in many traditions where the Shabbat Torah service lasts an hour. It requires active engagement, even from the members of the congregation who remain on the sidelines for all of it. And part of the reason for that might well be the long-standing tradition in Morocco that attributes to the Torah certain magical properties. Jeffrey Summit explains that the practice of the Shabbat Torah reading connects Jews horizontally across the world where everyone reads more or less the same passage every Shabbat, with notable exceptions of triennial portions in progressive congregations or differences in Israel and diaspora based on the festival calendar, but that it also connects Jews vertically across the generations. The Torah chanters he interviews reported that chanting the Torah makes them feel closely connected to their ancestors and helps them to feel ownership of the tradition. Anthropologists might frame this in terms of kinship, and sociologists might claim that there is a collective effervescence to conducting this ritual together, and both of those framings are no doubt appropriate. And I would also add to that analysis a framing from performance studies that considers the interplay of ritual and drama supplemented by this intangible feeling of magic that I can myself feel at my fingertips when rolling the Pereira scroll. So by way of that long introduction in this presentation, I will describe my recent work scouting out special North African Sifre Torah that have made extraordinary journeys in the dynamic and triangular pathways of Maghrebi Jews. In learning to chant the text of the Torah in the Moroccan style, I have learned much more than that. Of course, the letter is indeed central to Torah chanting, so much so that a single fault renders a scroll unusable in worship. But this is a letter to which we give a body through our voices that becomes a resonant living communal experience. My search across continents for special Moroccan Torah scrolls has yielded much more than the stories of scrolls themselves. It has demonstrated that embodied forms of Torah-based ritual knowledge add drama and magic to one of the world's oldest rituals. The three short vignettes I shared before, describing different encounters with Moroccan Torah rituals, offer a few brief glimpses into how this ritual drama magic complex plays out in chanting and performing the Torah in the Moroccan style. To go into a bit more detail, we will now go deeper into the nuts and bolts of chanting the Torah. In the particular case of my research, my gender and ethnicity factor heavily into my findings. Among the people in the world who consider themselves proficient in the Moroccan style of chanting the Torah, the vast majority, let's say probably well over 90%, are male. In order for a woman to become an expert in the tradition, she would first have to come from a liberal tradition, such as conservative or modern Orthodox Judaism, that both passes on the skill of chanting the Torah and also permits the tradition among girls, women too, of course, but particularly girls with regards to secondary education. Moroccan Jewry, as a predominantly Orthodox enterprise, has no such tradition as female chanting because of kolisha, ritual cleanliness, and so forth. Therefore, any woman who seeks to learn to chant must either first be an expert in Moroccan Judaism and then learn the tradition of chanting the Torah, or be an expert in chanting the Torah and then learn about Moroccan Judaism. There is no such category as female expert in Moroccan Torah chanting because nearly any woman who is religious enough to care about hearing the Torah chanted likely has been raised to think of the Torah scroll as the domain of men. So in that context, even with the best intentions, I couldn't just walk into a Moroccan synagogue and proclaim myself an expert in chanting the Torah. If I were a man who spent his life learning multiple chanting styles and showed motivation to excel in the Moroccan style, there's plenty of evidence that such a person would be welcomed with open arms, tutored, and invited to practice his craft publicly. The thought of this alternate universe brings to mind Virginia Woolf's exposition of Shakespeare's sister. And like with Shakespeare's sister, the very thing that might make me a welcome addition to the community as a man expertise in the text and passion for expanding my skills would also render my activities unacceptable, even blasphemous. So fieldwork has been slow going. I can't stroll into a service and ask a rabbi for an interview. I have to go a longer way around, becoming familiar to a community, and then only really asking the questions I want to ask once I have proven myself to be serious and well-intentioned. 
With those caveats in mind, I'd like to spend a few minutes exploring in some depth the system known as chironomy, the hand gestures that help the Baal Koreh, the person chanting from the Torah, to remember the cantillation marks. For men who are already cantillation experts, or who sit near the teva, the reading desk, on Shabbat morning, this might sound a bit basic, but please bear with me. Despite my 25 years of chanting the Torah, on a weekly basis for about half that time, I never saw chironomy in action until six months ago. Let's return to the synagogue in Paris that I mentioned at the beginning. I arrived in time for the Torah reading, hoping that I might get to see the Torah scroll. The scroll at the French synagogue I've attended in Tel Aviv is beautifully encased in metal because it used to be an Iraqi synagogue, but I had never really seen it because the machitza there, the separating screen that women sit behind, left me squinting through the latticework. I thought that if I got the right seat at the Paris synagogue, I might get a glimpse of the Sefer Torah, the script, the spacing, whether the parchment's texture looked different from afar. So I sat right in the middle of the Ezra Tanashim upstairs, with a view directly over the Teva if I was standing up. I think of Iris marrying Young in her classic text, Throwing Like a Girl, when she writes, that the space of yonder exists for feminine existence, but only as that which she is looking into rather than moving in. I spent the next two hours quite gratefully looking in. They took out the Torah scrolls, three that day, for Shabbat and Rosh Chodesh and Hanukkah. Two were cloth covered and one was metal covered. I got what I was there for, a chance to see the script from a reasonable distance. When the Chazan stepped up to the Teva to chant, I remained standing to watch. The women around me could have presumed me a zealot or a psychopath. And then I saw something I truly hadn't expected. The rabbi proceeded to render the ta'amim, the cantillation marks, in hand gestures. One for ma'arich tarcha adnach, another for sof pasuk, a more intricate one for rivia, two fingers for azla geresh, a spiraling motion for gershaim. For any Ashkenazi listeners, the Moroccan names of the ta'amim are slightly different, although also in Aramaic. From the speed of the gestures, I could see that both the rabbi and the chazan were quite practiced in this method, and extremely precise in the rendering of cantillation. It didn't take me long to be able to replicate most of the ta'amim myself, and I soon raced home to record myself demonstrating them in case I forgot them. I had, of course, heard that there were methods for displaying the ta'amim through hand gestures. It's called chironomy in English, or just simanim, signs, in Hebrew. The version I saw emanates from Fez, but in Rabbah, the reader would accompany himself. I've read that the Jews of Jerba would touch the reader's back with the shapes. Never having seen it, though, I had surmised that the practice had died out. It turns out that I just couldn't see it because of the machitza. It turns out that everyone does it, and not just Moroccans. Spanish Portuguese, Adanis, virtually anyone davening Nusach Sfard in London also uses hand gestures when chanting the Torah. And that turns the chanting into a performance, one that adds a live, embodied drama to the ritual. While trying to rem remember all the simanim, I also had to process something I could hardly believe. I saw before me a practice that despite my own decades of work to become an expert, I had never seen before because synagogue architecture kept me from seeing it. This shibolet of expertise, literally a secret handshake, had profound implications for the teaching of Torah chanting, and I didn't even know that I didn't know about it. In the weeks after that trip to synagogue in Paris, I read everything I could about Chironomy. Texts by Avi Neri, Be'er, Herzog, Jacobson, Kadari, Wicks, and more recent texts like the works of Essica Marx and Jeffrey Summit. Saul Levin, informed by the expertise of Asher Laufer, penned an article referring to chironomy in Sana, Cairo, and Jerba. Solomon Rosovsky's massive 1957 tome, The Cantillation of the Bible, devotes only one paragraph to the subject on page 521, so this was something of a DIY enterprise. It's worth explaining the system briefly. The system of chironomy ranges from simple to intricate, depending on the dual factors of the skill of the performer and the cantillation style of the chanter. In the Adani synagogue in Stamford Hill, for example, only ornamental disjunctives are marked, which is to say a rivia or a tevir, and not a zakev katon or an atnach. Even sof pasuk, the ultimate first level disjunctive, isn't demonstrated in any way. So at the Adani service, or indeed in any Yemenite service, there might be just two gestures in a verse or even none if the verse doesn't contain anything fancy. At the Moroccan synagogues I've attended in Paris, or indeed at Porat Yosef in Hendon, there is a different hand signal for each cantillation mark or ta'am, just as the chanter emphasizes clearly every note. The system is used in the Spanish-Portuguese synagogues in London, like Bevis Marks and Lauderdale Road too, but they are less symptom systematic. 
one member of Lauderdale Road, tells me that it is sort of improvised there. How chironomy works in practice can be illustrated by any Torah reading. Take this week's portion, Baha Lotra. Since the opening verse contains the tetragrammaton, let's take the second verse, Numbers chapter 8, verse 2, and illustrate it gesturally. Here's how it sounds in the Moroccan style. Daber el Harun vemerta elav behalotra et a nerot el mu pne hamenora ya iru shivat hanerot. This verse contains nothing fancy or special like a telsha or a tavir, but it has plenty of disjunctives. The gestures to go along with this verse could vary from as few as none to as many as six. Modeling that would offer several options, although this is only from what I've seen in the last six months and not the totality of Safar Yunusach. In the Aden community congregation, since every clause contains a first level disjunctive, or in other words, there are no fancy notes, there would be no gestures to accompany the verse. An Adeni rendition would include no simonim for this verse. In the Spanish Portuguese congregations of London, like Lauderdale Road, the simonim would be a simple waving of the hand for each clause culminating in a disjunctive, of which there are five. And in a Moroccan synagogue, it would be more precise. Three different gestures done a total of five times. One, Daber el Haron. Two, Vamarta elav. Three, Bahalotra et anerot. Four, El mu pne hamenora. Five, Yairu shivat hanerot. Those are a lot of options and they reflect the wide variety of melodic ornamentation we find in chanting styles that we might loosely call Tzfari. In total, the phenomenon reminds me of the passage in Exodus where Aaron and Hor raise Moses' hands during the Israelites' passage, pa battle with the Amalekites. These accompaniments to chanting turn the accompanist into a kind of conductor and increase the drama of the reading for anyone who is fortunate to catch a glimpse of it. There are some further implications to my discovery having to do with access. I feel that this specialist knowledge has been actively withheld from me, although it's a casualty of my being female rather than an active conspiracy. Going back to Iris marrying young and what I didn't know that I didn't know. For any lived body, the world appears as the system of possibilities which are correlative to its intentions. For any lived body, moreover, the world also appears as populated with opacities and resistances correlative to its own limits and frustrations. This text appears fixed but its performance practice appears to be ever-changing and often undocumented. It is only in live performance that the text is brought fully to life, and the gestural accompaniment is part of the alchemy that turns a two-dimensional text into a live drama. There's much more to explore in the ritual drama magic complex of the Moroccan style of chanting the Torah. You'll soon be able to read material I'm working on about specialist readings like Megillat Esther, the scroll chanted on Purim, and the Ta'am el Yon, the tune used to chant special and poetic passages like the Song of the Sea and the Ten Commandments in the Book of Exodus. In the meantime, one can find further reading from the Syrian tradition on additional readings in the superb work of Mark Kligman. As this project progresses, I will also expand on the connection between chanting the Torah and saint veneration. Just to wrap up, though, it's pretty obvious that there's nothing I can do about the religious limitations of Mechitza or Kol Isha or the strict enforcement of ritual purity laws. I will never have full access to the Torah scrolls that I am so eager to study, and I will probably never chant in public in a Moroccan synagogue. I can live with that. What gives me pause is this new awareness of all the other equally important cultural information that I'm missing by not being an insider in this particular tradition. I'll have to come to terms with that as I haggle with synagogues for access, some attempts at which have been mixed. But coming back to the Pereira scroll I mentioned at the beginning, and what the scroll means to a transnational network of Moroccan Jewry that is characterized today by movement and upheaval. Here we have a text that appears fixed, and yet its performance remains highly fluid and subject to adaptation. Is this not how communities are? Is this not how the history of worshipping in Nusach Sfardi has unfolded across the 20th century? Whether referring to the textual borders of an unusual 46-line scroll, or the the ethnic borders of who belongs to the community, or to the invisible borders between that which can be accessed and that which can't. The disjuncture between knowledge, practice, and access defines the life of a text and the lives of those who cherish it.